Hello everyone and welcome to Volcanoes. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. We got some really interesting stuff queued up and um, I'm looking forward to it. So okay, so first things first. Uh, you know, when we think about volcanoes, we all like to think of great big cone-shaped mountains that explode. And some of them definitely do, but there's actually a, a wide variety of different kinds of volcanoes, but also, uh, you know, the danger that different volcanoes present varies a great deal. Some of them are very dangerous and other ones are not. And they don't really go back and forth much. I mean, the ones that are dangerous are dangerous, and the ones that are not are not. And so, uh, if we look here, we can see Mount St. Helens, uh, which in 1980 erupted, blew 1,300 feet off the top of the mountain, killed a whole bunch of people. Uh, and this is what volcanoes in the Cascade Range are generally like, right? They tend to do this. Um, and then on the other hand, on the right-hand side here, we have Kilauea. Um, or, I don't know, one of the Mauna Loa, Kilauea, one, one of the um, Hawaiian volcanoes. Uh, and when they erupt, they ooze out some lava. They make these really spectacular, uh, what are called lava fountains. But people don't die. I mean, um, two years ago, I'll show you pictures, we'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, you know, there was a volcanic eruption in, um, in Hawaii that, that went on for several months and zero people died. Uh, th these volcanoes are just, they're spectacular and they're beautiful, but they're not dangerous. Uh, volcanoes like Mount St. Helens absolutely are. So, so what makes some volcanoes explosive and dangerous and other volcanoes not so? Well, it, it all comes down to viscosity. And viscosity is resistance to flowing, right? Viscosity is, uh, you know, the difference between a jar of honey and, you know, a jar of water, right? Both are liquids, uh, but if I, you know, put the honey up on top of my keyboard and turn it over, uh, you know, I got a few seconds before, a while before anything bad happens. Uh, if it ever happens, it might not even come out of the jar, right? On the other hand, I turn that water upside down, top of my keyboard, and I'm going to need a new computer. So, so um, that is viscosity. It is resistance to flowing. <coughs> No, I don't have the plague. Anyway, so um, so what controls viscosity in these lavas or magmas, right? Because the trick here is that um, high viscosity lavas or magmas tend to erupt violently because the pressure builds and then all of a sudden it gives all at once and boom, it's Mount St. Helens or Krakatoa or Tambora. Choose your favorite violent volcano, okay? Um on the other hand, if the lava or magma is low viscosity, then it, once again, just kind of oozes out. Okay, so what, what controls this viscosity? Well, a few things. First of all, temperature, right? Hotter magma is less viscous. Absolutely, right? And, you know, if we go back to our honey analogy, you put that honey in the microwave for about 30 seconds, it'll come right out of that jar, right? Higher temperature liquids tend to be uh, less viscous, right? And, and magma is not purely a liquid, but it's close enough, right? And so, yeah, temperature matters. But really, honestly, um, when we talk about volcanoes, we definitely talk about temperature, but, but one of the things we talk about more is the composition of the lava or magma. And by composition, I want you to all think back to our igneous rock compositions, because that's what I'm talking about here, right? Mafic, intermediate, and felsic, right? So the thing we want to worry about is silica. And if you'll remember, uh, when I was talking about igneous rock composition, I said, you know, silica, the silica is the thing, right? It, it, it is the thing to track. And so uh, it turns out that, yes, you can predict the explosiveness of a volcano uh, by knowing the silica um, uh, percentage, right? And so mafic volcanoes, very low in silica, they're not very viscous, and they are therefore not very explosive, okay? Um, let's jump to felsics, because felsics are kind of interesting. Felsics are very high in silica, they're very viscous, okay? They don't like to flow at all. And so, therefore, usually, they don't even make a volcano, right? They usually, felsic magmas, usually cool underground uh, and make, an, you know, a coarse, a phaneritic igneous rock, um, not a volcano, right? Once again, 
uh, think Stone Mountain, and I showed you plenty of pictures of Stone Mountain, right? That was never a volcano, right? That was a body of magma that probably moved upward a bit, but never breached the ground surface, right? Which is fundamentally what a volcano is, right? A volcano is, you know, an area where magma is breaching the ground surface, right? That, that's a volcano. Um, may, uh, felsic, rather, magmas are so thick and sticky and viscous that they don't make it to the ground surface. And so what you usually get is something like Stone Mountain. But if they do make it to the ground surface, run. And by run, I mean don't be in North America when Yellowstone erupts, right? Because, you know, that's, you know, that is a profoundly explosive volcano, right? And so, yeah. So, uh, and then, so, so if, if, if mafic um, magmas don't really make an explosive volcano and felsic magmas don't usually make a volcano, then what are we worried about? We're worried about intermediate ones, right? These are, you know, kind of the day in, day out explosive volcanoes, right? These, these, this is Mount St. Helens. Uh, uh, this is, you know, the, the Mount Hood, Mount Rainier, all the mountains of the, of the uh, Cascade Range, um, all the mountains in the Andes. Um, you know, the, uh, the, these are, these are the intermediate composition explosive volcanoes, right? And so, yeah, and we'll take another look at this here in just a minute. So, so yeah, so, so, but what else? Well, gases, gases also play a role, right? Uh, you know, as, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, magma is made up of, you know, solid crystals, liquid melt, and gases. And so, uh, but, but it's tricky because there's a lot about this that we frankly don't understand. Sometimes gases will help a magma flow, right? Um, those volatiles will help magma flow. Other times, though, um, those gases expand um, explosively, and that's where the violence of the volcanic eruption is coming from. So, so gases are tricky. Uh, if you if you want to be a volcanologist when you grow up, studying the role of gases uh, in determining the nature of a volcanic eruption would be a great thing. It really, truly would. Um, but let, let's come back to the silica idea for a second, because why, right? Why is it? that mafic volcanoes flow and felsic volcanoes blow. And that's literally the way volcanologists talk about this stuff. Will it flow or will it blow? Well, let's take a look at something we looked at before, and that's these silicate structures, right? Remember, I, when we were talking about minerals, I mentioned this, right? If you don't have a whole lot of silica, uh, you know, you're going to get individual... Um, uh, silicon oxygen tetrahedra, or maybe some single chains, uh, maybe some double chains, right? But the, but all of these, like, well, they'll flow past each other, right? If you just have you know, a lot of individual silicon oxygen tetrahedra not bound to each other uh, much, uh, the, it'll flow, right? And so, you know, in this part of, remember Bowen's reaction series, this is, this is the this is the first stuff up here. But in this part of the composition spectrum, where you don't have a lot of silica, you tend to make, um, you know, volcanoes that flow, like the Hawaiian ones. On the other hand, down here in the intermediate area, where you have more linkage between the silicon oxygen and tetrahedra, it makes very big polymerized molecules, and it doesn't like to flow. And so you get more excuse me more viscous um magmas more explosive volcanoes now um i didn't put it on a chart but here i'm going to bring it up if you're all the way down here in the felsic um area <laughs> okay now it's yellowstone right now if it's a volcano it's yellowstone or more commonly it's stone mountain right it's a big uh, batholith, right? To, to use terms that we've learned. Okay. So, so yeah, so, so this linkage between the silicon oxygen tetrahedra is the key generally to understanding why a volcano is or is not explosive. Less linkage, more flow, not blowing, right? More linkage, less flow, 
more explosive. So yeah, so 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 um, I don't know why I have this slide up here, but just for summary, there it is again. <laughs> and so uh, and so let's uh, let's let's think about what actually comes out during an eruption. And we talked. I already kind of mentioned this, but let's talk about it again. Um, you know, when a volcano erupts, what what wh what's coming out? Well, a few things. Um, first of all, uh, maybe most obviously lava, right? Which is molten rock above ground. Now, um, <coughs> now this brings up something kind of interesting. Um, why do we give it a different name when it's above ground versus below ground? Right? And I tell you, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna hold off on telling you why for a minute, uh, but there's a good reason. Okay, so so lava, molten rock above ground. Um, the terminology here comes from Hawaii, and so um, you can have. Um, you can have a uh, very flowy um, lava, not very viscous. Uh, it's frequently described as ropey, um, which is always a weird word, but I can't think of a better one. Uh, it looks like you have a bunch of ropes laid up against each other down here, right? That's where we get the, the ropey thing from. And I, I don't know. I wish someone would think of a better way to describe that. But there it is. Um, we call these, these lava flows pahoyhoy. Uh, they tend to be a little bit less viscous. They're probably a little bit warmer, even lower in silica. Um, and so, yeah, pahoy hoy. Uh, the other kind of lava is ah ah, uh, literally a a. Um, it's a great crossword puzzle um, uh, word. They, they use them all. They use it all the time. Uh, here's a pahoy hoy flow down here, and then here's an ah ah flow up here. You can see that it's more viscous. Um, you know, it's uh, it's sharper. You can argue. You can see the rock up here. You can actually see the lava in there. Uh, this is this lava is usually cooler, maybe a wee bit higher in silica, uh, and so it's more for whatever reason. It's more viscous, right? Ah, uh -uh flows basically look like a big pile of burning rock, right? And then if we if we come even uh, further. Uh, or think, uh, uh, you know, kind of go from, you know, uh, smooth, ropey lava to blocky lava. We can even go one step further and get to something that we actually call block lava. Um, uh, this is a, uh, a lava flow at SP Crater uh, in Arizona. We'll talk a little more about SP Crater uh, in a little bit. In fact, I'm going to show it to you on Google Earth. But when you look at it on the ground, this is what it looks like. Uh, the, you know, it's not a nice smooth lava flow. It's 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 blocky, uh, and this has to do with temperature and composition and force and all kinds of other things. A volcanologist could probably tell you more than I can, but almost certainly. But 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 block lava, right? So in a continuum, we kind of go from smooth pahoyhoy to kind of sharp ah uh, uh, to you know blocky lava, which is oddly enough called block lava. Um, what happens though if your eruption, uh, if your lava is extruded underwater? Uh, well, that brings us to something really fascinating called a pillow basalt. Um, and um, pillow basalt, sorry, hold on. Mm. I had something in my mouth. Mm, still do. There we go. Okay. Uh, pillow basalts, like I said, are what happens when um, when um, you get lava is extruded underwater, right? And what happens is the minute that lava uh, it reaches the water, it, it freezes, right? It, it solidifies, but it gets pushed out even more by the pressure of the lava behind it. And so you end up with these rounded forms um, called pillow basalts or pillow lavas, not because they're soft, obviously, but because they look like pillows. Uh, these are very common along mid-ocean ridges. Uh, more is geology talk for, for mid-ocean ridge. And we can look at a kind of a a diagrammatic um, thing of this, and you can see you know, you've got a you've got a, a little vent or tube here extruding lava, uh, but it does it because because the minute it hits the water, it freezes or solidifies, and then it breaks through, and you can see it breaking through over here on the right hand side of this. So yeah, so um, so uh, pillow basalts very common among along mid-ocean ridges and so if you see one of these on dry land and every now and then you do you know that that area used to be very very underwater and so yeah uh what else did, did volcanoes extrude well gases right a lot of gas right i mean we know you know that 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 you know lavas are you know that magmas 
or you know, molten rock is composed of, you know, a uh, solid liquid and gas, right? It's composed of solid crystals, liquid melt, and gases. Don't if you, if you're studying for the test, don't memorize the gases. Just 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 don't. Okay. Um, um, don't. Okay. Now the most common one is water vapor though. And, and that's going to come back and bite us in the butt here in a few minutes. So let's keep that one in mind. Carbon dioxide, that's the gas causing uh, global climate change. No, it's not the volcanoes. The volcanic contribution to atmospheric carbon dioxide is tiny relative to the human contribution so don't blame the volcanoes sulfur dioxide is toxic hydrogen sulfide gas is toxic carbon monoxide is toxic um sulfuric acid is toxic hydrochloric acid is toxic hydrofluoric acid is ridiculously toxic so uh and so you know um none of this is you know well okay the, the, you know the first few aren't that big a deal but none, none of this is really good uh, especially not when you get down here um and so yeah uh so so um now we can talk a little bit about the difference between lava and magma right why do we give it a different name because you know when i first learned that you know it had a different name i was like that's stupid you know if i bury my car keys they don't you know they don't get a different name just because they're underground okay here's the trick though it doesn't work that way right magma is not buried lava uh, that really only works in one direction. I mean, yeah, you can bury lava, but it doesn't get turned back into magma. It just, it just doesn't. So, um, so, um, so what's going on here? Well, as long as it's under pressure, it still contains these gases, right? But once it, once it reaches the surface, those gases escape. And so now it is compositionally and physically different. So we give it a different name. Right. And so, yeah, so so it, it behaves differently. Everything about it is different. And so so it gets a different name. So once again, if you bury that lava, you haven't put the gases back into it. So it, no, it's just buried lava. It's not magma. Right. So so it's not it's not so much the buried versus surface. Right. It's the it's the does it or does it not contain the gases and the way it loses the gases is by breaching the surface. Right. It's kind of like, you know, your Diet Coke before you open it is magma, all right? Stick with me here, okay? If I open it and let it sit for a few hours, all that carbonation goes away, now it's lava, right? And if you taste it, it tastes different, right? It doesn't have that fizzy aspect to it. It is compositionally different, okay? Now, continuing the analogy, if I shake it up and open it, now those gases are escaping, you know, um, violently, right? And so in an uncontrolled way, right? Now you have an explosive eruption, right? And so I love that analogy. I thought about it about a year ago, and I think it works great, okay? So, so that's why we give it a different name. Okay, so lava, gases, what else? Well, tephra. Uh, which is also called pyroclastic material, right? This is just anything solid thrown out of a volcano, okay? And so this is a volcano um, in Iceland. Uh, no one can pronounce its name, but there it is. Uh, everyone I know either calls it just Aya, which gets you the first syllable, or I just call it Bob. Um, Bob <laughs> erupted several years ago now threw a whole bunch of ash into the air. It was mostly an ash um, event. I'll show you more pictures of Bob uh, here in just a little bit. Here's a Landsat picture showing all this ash streaming away from Iceland to Europe. And as we'll see, Icelandic volcanoes have a long and proud history of erupting in Iceland and affecting Europe. And so uh, that's, that's not at all unusual. But if we go back and just think about tephra in general, it comes in sizes. <coughs> and so you can see here, there are things, you know, um, you know, landing very near the volcano that are boulder sized things that are called, you know, uh, sometimes called volcanic blocks or volcanic bombs. Uh, these would obviously be very bad if they hit you, uh, although you really shouldn't be that close to the volcano while it's erupting. These don't get thrown far, right? This is not something that's going to hit you 20 miles from the volcano, right? Um, and then there's uh, Lapilli, which is kind of uh, pebble-sized, 
particles coming down and that's interesting uh but you know um but it's it you know that's not you know neither of those are really dangerous <coughs> hold on i need some water guys there we go uh neither of those are really dangerous what's really dangerous actually and we'll talk about this when we talk about how to die in a volcano is the ash uh it's not very big at all uh and it can be blown literally hundreds of miles from the volcano and be dangerous when it gets there. Here's a scanning electron microscope picture of an individual piece of volcanic ash. And you can see how sharp it is. That gets in your lungs. It's just going to rip your lungs up from the inside. It, it, it really just is. And so, um, <coughs> and so, um, so yeah, you don't want to be breathing this stuff. I mean, you really, truly do not want to be breathing this stuff. I worked an ash bed, about a, about a three foot, one meter thick ash bed in uh, Texas. There were plant fossils in it. Otherwise, I would not be working anything having to do with volcanic rock. But there were plant fossils, right? Uh, you know, deposits of volcanic... <coughs> <coughs> I swear I don't have the plague, but my throat is not doing well with this. Um... Um, a three foot thick uh, deposit of volcanic ash that um, had some plant fossils in it. Uh, I traced the, the ash back to the Sierra Madre Occidental volcano all the way down in Mexico. And so um, um, uh, that, that ash traveled, you know, several hundred miles, was several feet thick when it got to Texas. So, uh, and, and preserved plant fossils, which was really nice. But when I, even when I was messing with it, uh, you know, uh, thousands of years later, um, I'm actually millions of years later, um, um, I was wearing a respirator because under no circumstances do you want to breathe that ash. I would pull plant fossils out of it and you could just see tendrils of volcanic ash uh, going up into the air. And so, no, don't want to be breathing that. So, but, but yeah, there, there is an order to this, right? I mean, you know, you get volcanic bombs very near the, the crater, you know, the smaller stuff a little bit further away, and the ash can, can literally be um, literally hundreds of miles from the volcano. And, uh, and as we'll see, uh, ash can actually have global consequences. So we want to keep uh, that in mind two and we'll talk a bit more about that just a little bit later so when we think about volcanoes we all like to think of great big cone-shaped mountains but that's really not what they are or not well okay some of them are <laughs> uh, but there's different kinds of volcanoes right um the largest are shield volcanoes so named because relative to how wide they are uh they're not terribly tall now don't get me wrong these are very tall volcanoes but they're so wide that they um that there, you know, it's like a shield, right? Imagine Captain America's shield laying on a table, right? It's a lot wider than it is tall. All right, so these are large. They're generally mafic in composition, so most of what they extrude is is lava, as opposed to ash or pyroclastics or something like that. They also extrude a lot of gas. Uh, now, now, this is all relative. Uh, you know, um, there there are times when they extrude other things, and there are. A whole, you know, styles of eruptions thing here, but I'm, I'm being very general, okay? A uh, great example is Hawaii, and then also the Tamu Massif, which I'll talk more about here in just a second. But also, I mean, we've all, you know, Hawaii we, we, we get, but let me show you another really kind of cool shield volcano. This is Olympus Mons on Mars, um, it is the largest volcano in the solar system, um, and it is part of a complex of volcanoes that are about this size. Olympus Mons is 80,000 feet tall, measured from the surrounding area, right? Um, in contrast, I mean, Mount Everest is 29,000 feet tall, right? So it is way taller uh, than anything on the United, in the, in, not in the United, sorry, on the Earth. Um, in terms of area, I don't have a number, but I do have a picture. It's about the size of Arizona. Yeah, really big dang volcano. Uh, interestingly, um, you know, if, uh, <coughs> um, this volcano formed on a planet that doesn't really have active plate tectonics. 
Um, you know, and and it's just it's 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 and that, that's actually why it formed, right? Because on a planet with plate tectonics, you wouldn't get one volcano; you would get a string of them, right? You would get Hawaii, all the Hawaiian islands, plus all the underwater volcanoes in that complex, all the way up to the Emperor Seamount chain, right? Well, uh, because the Pacific Plate moves over that hot spot, right? We talked about hot spots when we talked about plate tectonics, right? Um, you know, it's easiest to make a volcano of this size on a planet that doesn't have plate tectonics, right? Because now that plate doesn't move over the hot spot. You just end up with all that material in one place okay another uh, let's go back and look at hawaii though right hawaii 2018 uh eruption of mauna loa on the south side uh lots of these fissures which we'll talk a wee bit more about primarily though a lava event um lava is very destructive but it's not very deadly uh, it moves generally slowly enough that you can get out of the way. This thing erupted for three months and no one, zero people were killed. Uh, and that that's the nature, though, of these eruptions, right? These low viscosity, mafic, shield volcanic eruptions where, yeah, you extrude a lot of lava uh, and there's lots of property damage, don't get me wrong, but there's no one in that house right now, right? They left. They have left. Um, and so, yeah, here's a, ni here's a nice picture on the ground. Uh, of that fissure eruption um, uh, very spectacular looking not deadly not dangerous well dangerous obviously if you're close but but no one gets close um, at least not normal people volcanologists they get close they're crazy um, uh, here's a, the, I, this is a oh gosh this is a, um, this lava flow coming down through here uh, here's a bay and just I mean just just a couple of days later it had just there's the bay underneath all the rock, right? And so uh, it is just unstoppable. Uh, you know, people, well, spray it with a hose or anything, you know. Uh, there, people in Iceland have had very limited success with that. Mostly you just let it go and get out of the way, right? Um, so I'm going to show you an animation of this, lava, this, uh, this volcanic event. Um, notice this um crater right here let me go back and show you to you back here uh um there it is right there uh that crater right there we're going to see it on a on a map and then here's this bay we're also going to see that on a map so let me show you so um so yeah so first of all you can see the you know the lava spreading um and then that crater that we were looking at is right there and that bay that we were looking at that gets covered over is right there right and so you can see you know this particular event added you know land <laughs> to uh to uh hawaii and so hawaii by the way has a law that any new land added by a volcano belongs to the state so there's not like this weird land rush to you know claim this land or whatever but but you know this was a, mostly a fissure eruption right i mean you can see the series of fissures here that that fed uh, this eruption over the course of about three months right first it kind of went down here and then it kind of went around here and once again there's that crater uh, that we saw in the in the picture and and yeah so they've got I don't know how much but they got quite a bit of new land there but unfortunately it just absolutely obliterated uh, the entire what's called vacation land uh, community there um, and so so yeah now now once again interestingly uh, no one, you know, this, this volcano erupted <laughs> for about three months uh, and killed no one, no one. Uh, uh, this were, these were, I believe, the only injuries. That's 23 people injured on a boat that was way too close to where the lava was going into the ocean, right? You don't want to be that close. Uh, uh, you know, th that temperature change can cause all kinds of explosive effects that can do all kinds of very, very strange things. You do not want to be... Uh, that close to that eruption. Um, when we were talking about shield volcanoes, I mentioned the Tamu Massif, which is a really weird. Oh, sorry, which is a really weird name. I know. Let me explain it because it kind of makes sense. Tamu stands for Texas A and M University, uh, where I went to graduate school, by the way. And people from uh, Texas A and M uh, found this uh, this volcano. Massif is just another word for underwater volcano. 
So this was an underwater volcano found by scientists from Texas A&M. So because it's underwater, I can't show you just a photograph of it, right? But here's where it is. There's Japan. So it's off the coast of Japan. My guess is Hawaii is like about right here, right? And so, so kind of between Japan and Hawaii. Um, and, you know, we knew, we knew that that hump was there. You, can't, you cannot hide a hump that big on the seafloor, right? That, that, that's not going to happen. But they, what we didn't know was that it was a volcano. Uh, and so uh, here's a side scan sonar of it showing uh, a little more detail about the topography and whatnot. Uh, we don't really have a good idea about scale yet. Let me show you this. Um, so, you know, here, here's the Tamu Massif here. It's part of a complex of volcanoes. So just to give you an idea about size, that is about the size of England. So um, <coughs> that is an England-sized volcano. Um, the lines and the red dots that you see here are uh, DSDP, Deep Sea Drilling Program, um, uh, boreholes into this complex of volcanoes in an attempt to learn about this. Uh, this is a huge volcano, y'all. This is a, you know, this is an Olympus Mons size volcano. Uh, not nearly as tall, but in terms of area, it's getting there. Okay, and uh, remember how, in fact, in fact, um, this dark spot here, that's Olympus Mons. So, you know, it, it, yeah, it's thinner, it's longer, whatever, but it's in the same size range, right? There is nothing else on the planet that's in the size range of Olympus Mons. And so remember how I told you that Olympus Mons is there because, uh, because Mars doesn't have plate tectonics? And yet here we are with a giant volcano on the Earth that most assuredly does have plate tectonics. So there's an interesting question. Um, but as I was saying before, these blue lines are DSDP uh, borehole uh, tracks. Uh, the, the Joint A's Resolution, a drilling ship uh, based out of Texas A&M University, um, has been out there drilling it. Uh, to learn more about it. Um, and then this line here from A to B is a, a si what we call a seismic line uh, sending down, um, sending down uh, sound waves and letting them bounce off of the surface and bounce off of the rock to give you a profile of the volcano. Now, this is way too steep, right? Way too steep. Uh, you know, here's a, you know, here, right? This 90 degree uh, angle here is only 10 degrees in real life. Okay, so there's a lot of what we call ver um, vertical exaggeration here. Okay, but you can see, you know, the reflection on the surface, uh, and then there's some sediment there, and then uh, reflections of the uh, of the uh, of the lava flows and whatnot. And so, um, and so, yeah, this is a fascinating volcano, uh, and one that's really only been studied as such within the last five or six years or so. So it really is, really is just an interesting thing. Uh, I don't know. I guess I got more gratuitous pictures of lava uh, here. So there's one, and there's another one. And, you know, the thing about lava is there's no one in the house, right? I mean, it's not, it's, you know, lava is kind of the thing that people think is dangerous, when it's not, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just, it's just not. Um, okay, so, so, um, shield volcanoes, the biggest, okay, the most common are cinder cones. Uh, they're not very big, <coughs> they're usually also mafic. Mostly, though, they extrude tephra, not lava, although there are important exceptions. Um, but nevertheless, they do. So, so um, um, uh, they're, they're, they're very common. They're not very big. Let me, um, let me go set up something on Google Earth, y'all. I will be right back. Okay, so we're back. Uh, let's zoom in on uh, Sunset Crater, uh, which is um, in the San Francisco volcanic field, uh, sometimes called the Valley of Fire um, in Arizona. And yes, um, I don't know why. There's a San Francisco volcanic field in Arizona. I don't make the rules. But anyway, there it is, uh, Sunset Crater. A pretty big cinder cone. Uh, this, it is, let me, let's, let's, let's just measure it real quick here. Um, and if I just measure it from one end to the other, um, probably ends about right there. Uh, that's about a mile across, right? And so, but for a cinder cone, that's pretty big. 
um, you know, uh, it really is. And so uh, we can, I can, I can, if I clear that and I tell it to do a path, and uh, let me see, can I do this? Blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to mess too much with this. And yes, I can. Okay, so if I do this, and I do this again, we can. Oh, I do this again. Uh, we can cut across it and you can see, you know, you go up, you go down into the crater and then you go down the other side and it's about a mile across, right? You could hike up it pretty, pretty easily, really. It's, 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 it's not that bad. And what it really looks like is just a pile of rock uh, that got thrown out of a volcano. Uh, but here's the thing about this area. Um, if I if I zoom out a bit, it's not the only cinder cone around here. Look at this, right? There's a there's a cinder cone there, 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 there. Most of them cinder cones don't stick around a lot because they're basically just piles of rock, and so they tend to. Um, they tend to weather away very, very quickly. But there's a lot of volcanoes just in this area. And in fact, we aren't even done yet. Uh, there's, there's another volcano there. And here's a whole other field of them um, up here, um, including this one, which we're already familiar with. Uh, this is SP Crater. This is uh, that volcano where we saw the block lava. Uh, this is SP Crater. Now, the name is weird, SP Crater. Um, so, it was named by the locals who looked at that block lava um, and thought it looked like an outhouse. And so, uh, there's no delicate way to say this. SP stands for shit pot. Sorry, I won't say it again, but it does. And so, rather than having to walk around and say that all the time, we just call it SP Crater. I don't know why someone didn't come up with a better name that we can use, but there it is and so but you can see that there's a lava flow that's a little bit unusual uh right none of the other cinder cones had lava but this one sure does and there it is and we already saw it on the ground um uh with that block lava diagram that we saw so so cinder cones very very common right <coughs> um but they don't stick around long uh because once again they really are just kind of piles of uh tephra um, and so they tend to weather away very quickly. Um, another, um, another cinder cone that we'll talk about, I'll, I'll go ahead and show it to you now, uh, down in Mexico, uh, Paracutine, uh, was another one that erupted and had a lava flow. Um, um, a couple people died. We'll talk about how later, but in a, in a rather unusual way. But uh, this is a pretty substantial lava flow, and it did uh, cover, a, cover a town. Um, I'll sh we'll, we'll have some pictures of Paracutine, but I just wanted to show you um, on Google Earth uh, while, we were, uh, while we were over here. So, so I'm going to jump back to PowerPoint. I'll be back in just a second. Okay, we're back, and I got some water, so my throat ought to be okay. Alrighty, so cinder cones, usually mafic, very common. Um, here's SP Crater, aerial photograph uh, that we just saw on, uh, on Google Earth. And then here's another one. Um, yeah, go on, come on. Switch the slide, there we go. There's Paracutine, uh, the one that we also saw um, on Google um on Google Earth, and there's the chapel uh, from the uh, uh, eruption, and I'm trying to remember when that was. I don't see a year. Uh, it was uh, World War II era, 1940-something, when it, when it erupted. Uh, now, of course, the volcanoes that we're, we're most used to when we think about volcanoes are these, you know, great big cone-shaped mountains, right, like Mount Fuji that you see here um, in... Um, in Japan, right? Uh, these are usually intermediate in composition. Um, they emit both lava and tephra. Uh, they, um, you know, they, they sometimes their eruptions are just like blowing off steam. Other times they're massively dangerous. And so um, I remember, you know, Mount St. Helens, at, you know, erupted in uh, 1980, killed a whole bunch of people. Uh, and then back in 2004, I think, right after I came to, to SPC, uh, you know, um, uh, people were like, hey, it's going to go again. Um, and, you know, volcanic eruptions don't usually catch us by surprise. They're, they're warning signs. They creak. They bulge. You get an uptick in volcanic, uh, volcanic in uh, earthquake activity. So uh, while we cannot predict volcanic eruptions, we can give warning when they are imminent. And so, you know, everyone, hey, this thing's going to go again. It's going to go again. And it blew off some steam. 
and then it was done. <laughs> so, um, so you know, the nature of these eruptions can vary a lot. But these are the these are the violent volcanoes that usually occur, of course, at these ocean continent convergent boundaries, right, where you mix you know, mafic seafloor with felsic continental crust to make, you know, an intermediate composition um, lava or magma as we talked about when we talked about uh, igneous rocks. And so, yeah, so, um, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, there's Mount St. Helens before, there's Mount St. Helens after, uh, I believe that's Mount Hood, uh, you know, all the... Um, all of the volcanoes of our Cascade Range are like this. Uh, the volcanoes in um, the Andes Mountains are like this. You know, um, anywhere... <coughs> here I'm coughing again. But anyway, anywhere you have a um, an ocean continent convergent boundary producing intermediate composition magmas, you get these volcanoes. Uh, and so uh, just to kind of sum up this little bit here, uh, you can see... Um, you can see, uh, you know, the, the size difference, right? There's a, a sunset crater, the one I showed you on, um, on Google Earth a minute ago, right? It's tiny compared to, say, Mount Rainier, which is a big composite cone volcano, which is also tiny when compared to Mauna Loa in Hawaii, um, which is a nice big um um uh, shield volcano which is of course you know not big at all compared to you know something like olympus mons here in blue or even the tamu massif there kind of in brown and then the green is mauna loa mauna loa is obviously uh taller than the tamu massif because it sticks up above water but in area it's not nearly as big um and depending on how you measure it, the tamu massif might even be uh, you know, longer, if you, as you, if you will, uh, than, uh, than Olympus Mons. Now, interestingly, um, if you were to measure <laughs> Mauna Loa from where it actually begins on the seafloor, it would be the tallest mountain on the planet by a lot, not Everest. Okay. But by convention, we measure mountains from sea level that lops about 10,000 feet off of Mauna Loa. So, so no. All right. So anyway, there's our three kinds of volcanoes. Now, uh, what are the problems, right? What, what, um, you know, which I call, you know, seven and a half ways to die in a volcano. It used to be six and a half, and then I found out about another one. So now it's seven and a half. Okay. So um, first, some minor things, right? Gases, right? The difference between lava and magma is gas, right? Those gases are toxic, right? Here they are listed again. Water vapor is not a big deal, but it's going to come back to bite us. And carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, toxic. Hydrogen explodes. Carbon monoxide, that's the gas that drives global uh, climate change. Oh, I'm sorry, no, it's not. That's carbon dioxide. Carbon monoxide is what comes out of your exhaust in your car that kills you when people, you know, commit suicide via vehicle exhaust. It's the carbon monoxide that, that's getting them. Um, hydrogen toxic, hydrochloric acid toxic, hydrofluoric acid, very toxic, etc. But, um, you you know, and, and it's important also to know that these gases can be present if there's not an active eruption. I mean, you might just be hiking along on the side of a volcano and you go down into a, uh, into a depression and suddenly that's not air anymore, right? Uh, that's this stuff and you can't breathe any of this stuff. So you want to be a little careful uh, hiking around on volcanoes. Even if they're not active, these gases are still there. In fact, when we put equipment out to monitor volcanoes, when we put seismographs and tilt meters and laser range finders and all this equipment out to monitor volcanoes that equipment has a very short lifespan much shorter than it would anywhere else because those gases are there and they're corrosive and so you get much less time out of a piece of equipment on the side of a volcano than you do if you're just sticking it out somewhere else. So gases are a problem. Uh, lava is certainly on the list. Uh, it's, you know, 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you know, um, yeah, it'll set things on fire. It'll, you know, it'll do bad things. Um, but it moves pretty slow. Um, it's, uh, and it moves fairly predictably, right? There's plenty of time to get out of the way. Uh, as I've said over and over again, Hawaii extruded lava for 
I don't know, how long? Uh, three months, a couple years ago, and zero people died, right? They were able to get out of the way. You saw the animation of all that lava coming out of that fissure. No one died, <laughs> okay? Um, you know, here's a guy, National Guard dude, standing in front of a lava flow, saying, hey, don't go there, you know, as if you need someone to tell you that. But still, uh, most people who either die or who are injured by lava are, you know, <laughs> frankly, volcanologists messing with it right uh wanting to sample it or something there are way you know usually when you do this you wear you know an asbestos suit and you have like a literally 10 foot pole that you can poke it with to get some i don't know who this person pissed off that they get a rock hammer a hard hat and a sweater but oh they got a safety vest so yay um so yeah uh, this is not usually the way you do this i don't know i don't know what's going on here but anyway but yeah that's how you get injured by lava right not not just you know lava you know running you down or chasing you down or flowing you down or whatever uh it doesn't usually work that way um lava does not come tearing down the side of the volcano catching everyone by surprise that is entirely something else which we will talk about here in a minute uh we talked about tephra in terms of things that volcanoes extrude now here it is once again in things that'll kill you uh we already talked about this right very dangerous, dangerous hundreds of miles from the volcano. There's a volcanic bomb. There's Mount St. Helens erupting, and there's that SEM picture we've already seen. Uh, kind of already done this, but I wanted to just put it over here with the ways to die in a volcano. And, of course, here's Bob again. Uh, you know, Bob was primarily a, uh, a an ash event located right here on the southern side of... Um, Oh, I got an arrow already on the southern side of Iceland. And we already saw the Landsat picture of all that ash streaming off of that volcano. It really was just spectacular. Here's some pretty horses with some ash. Here's the ash accumulated uh, you know, on the ground. Now I got to sneeze. What the heck? And then here's some uh, geologists sampling... <coughs> Here we go, sampling the ash. Notice that there, there are valid scientific right, to reasons to do this. You want to monitor the uh, the composition of this eruption to see, you know, what to get a better idea about what's going on. Notice, though, they are not taking their helmets off. Uh, yeah, no, right? You don't want to breathe that stuff. Um, here's another Landsat picture of all of that ash streaming away from Iceland where it shut down air travel all over Europe for a long time uh for a few weeks uh because you cannot fly through volcanic ash uh that that airplane engine sucks the ash in melts it basically turns it into lava that gets stuck on your airplane parts and that is as they say a bad way to fly uh you would think let me just jump back here real quick you would think you're like okay there's the ash don't fly through it and you're fine, but it doesn't work that way. There are smaller concentrations of ash all around here that you can't see, nor can your Doppler radar. So you, you figured out you're flying through ash when your engines quit, and that's not good. So, uh, so yeah, they shut down air travel all over Europe, all over Europe. Um, this ash can have global consequences. Um, you know, uh, if we think about uh, climate, and this this would be a uh, subscript too. Sorry about that. But um, you know, we think about climate, and you know, sometimes you know some people like to kind of blame the volcanoes for global climate change. Don't do that. Uh, that's not the volcanoes. So let's not worry about the CO two with respect to to climate change. But we do want to think a little bit about ash, right? I mean, we 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 really truly do. Uh, this trend that we're seeing in increasing temperature temperatures has nothing to do with volcanoes it has everything to do with with humans pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere oddly enough when you pump heat trapping gas into the air the air gets warmer crazy i know but there it is um and so um so uh but what what how how can that ash affect <coughs> climate well let's take a look at a reconstruction so this ends in 2004. I mean, it's 2020. We're 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 you know we're up here now. But anyway, uh, you can see that if we go back, you know, um, you know, um, oh, I don't know. Um, if we go back to the year, you know, 1000, right, we can see that temperatures uh, were generally cooling um, uh, as a result from that. Ah, sorry, let me go back. 
Um, I messed up my PowerPoint here. There we go. Temperatures were generally cooling um, as a result of um, of um, of uh, coming down from the medieval warming period, and things were generally cooling. Uh, but do you see right here where? Uh, in, oh, I don't remember the exact year, I want to say 1812 or something like that, but um, you can see how, uh, 1812, I'm thinking about like the War of 1812 or something, but anyway, right here, you can see all of the global uh, climate indicators dip, right? That is a volcano in Tambora, uh, the, I'm sorry, that is a volcano in Indonesia named Tambora, throwing enough ash into the air to block the sun globally caused what was known as the year without a summer um, um, and caused crop failures all over the world. If you count the crop failures, this volcano killed millions of people millions of people and so uh this ash really can have uh, uh you know an effect globally um and so it's nothing to 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 you know not take seriously right and so here's uh we already saw this diagram kind of prevailing winds growing this way blowing that ash ash other pyroclastic lava etc all this stuff i'm not even sure why that diagram's there but there it is uh okay so let's think about something though this is actually this is a good diagram to have this might be why i have it here who knows remember the uh remember the main gas thrown out of a volcano water vapor all right and by the way we're about 50 minutes into this lecture i'm not going to put in a break but you should feel free obviously at any time to hit pause get up and walk around um, I plan on having this wrapped up in about an hour 15 or so. Uh, we'll see how I hit that. But, um, you know, maybe hit pause, walk around a bit, you know, relax uh, and come back. Okay. Or stick with me. But, you know, anyway, um, take care of yourself. Okay. Uh, remember the main gas that a volcano puts out, right? Water vapor. Okay. By far. I mean, by far. Um, and so you're doing two things simultaneously. You're pumping a lot of volcan you're pumping a lot of ash into the air, uh, and you're pumping a lot of water vapor in the air. Well, that combination of ash and water vapor will make rain. That that ash provides what meteorologists call a condensation nucleus, and it absolutely will make it rain. And so suddenly you've got a lot of rain falling down on a um, on a volcanic slope that has ash already laying on it. The combination of that ash and that rain makes mud. Uh, a mud flow called a lahar. Um, these are these are very dangerous. Um, they come quickly. They can be dangerous a long way from the volcano. They take out bridges. They take out infrastructure. They can be very unpredictable. Um, um, in nineteen eighty eruption of Mount St Helens. I was a freshman in high school. Is it eighty or eighty two? I can never remember. Anyway, I was in high school, and the thing that I remember from the Mount St Helens eruption is days and days of news footage of these lahars. They were really incredible. Uh, you can see one coming down from the flank. Um, you can see here. See, the problem is they take out bridges. So it's, it's suddenly it's very hard. If you have someone over here who needs an ambulance, they might not be able to get one. Uh, and so um, that, that's really, um, really a problem. It really is. I mean... Um, the blast from Mount St. Helens knocked down a whole bunch of trees, and then the Lahars picked them up and started smacking them uh, into bridges and just taking out bridges. Um, uh, I, I really, I love this picture. I love this picture because, well, I mean, I, I like it. But anyway, um, you can see how far up the tree the mud went. And then, I don't know if you all have noticed it or not, but there's a person, right? A uh, person wearing a yellow suit okay so you know if you assume six feet for that person that's 18 or 20 feet up that tree uh and so yeah these are these are a real problem um it, it's funny because um this was something that um we knew happened from the uh from the rock record but we had never really got a good look at one well mount st helens changed that uh we got a really good look at some lahars and they're very dangerous um what's even more dangerous though is something called the pyroclastic flow. 
And th this is this is the thing that comes rolling down the side of the mountain, killing people. It is a mixture of hot, dry rock, gases, ash, everything bad about a volcano, all rolled into one thing. Right? Let, let me let me describe it this way. So here's here's Mount St. Helens, right? And so imagine you're dangling from a rope over that vent. Right, everything bad about the volcano is there, right? All those gases, all that ash, hot rock, lava getting thrown up, all all everything bad about a volcano is happening right there, right? But it's moving up, right? As long as a volcano is spewing all that nastiness up, it's not good, but it's not horrible, right? What a pyroclastic flow is, is all of that stuff that would normally be going up coming down. And I've got a really good video of a pyroclastic flow that I will put in the module with this lecture. Uh, you'll want to watch it. it. No, you're not going to see anyone die, but you get a really good look at a pyroclastic flow. And I'll put a version of it in there um, that talks about a French couple named Maurice and Katia Kraft. They were volcanologists who traveled all over the world. Uh, and they were killed in a pyroclastic flow on mountains in, in Japan. And so, um, not going to see anyone die. Don't worry, not going to do that to you. But there it is, right? Uh, I don't have a whole lot of pictures of these because, frankly, anyone who got too close dies. I mean, it's not it's not something that's terribly easy to photograph. Um, although I will talk about um, um, Mount uh, Fuego here in just a few minutes. But, but you know, the, the eruption on Mount St. Helens, once again, the, the pyroclastic flow knocked out a whole bunch of trees. This is Mount St. Helens here in the upper left. And then, and then of course, the Lahar comes down and picks up the trees. And, yeah, bad things happen. Okay. Uh, here's an older picture of one in the Philippines, uh, which is um, kind of interesting. But, but uh, and then I think we've all heard of Pompeii. Uh, Pompeii was one of two um, um, uh, cities or towns um, uh, destroyed in the volcanic eruption here of Mount Vesuvius. Pompeii is literally Naples, Italy. I mean, it's like a suburb there. Uh, if you look at it on Google Earth, it's like there's all the, and there's this big volcano, right? This is not two volcanoes. This is Vesuvius uh, with the top blown off of it, okay? Uh, Vesuvius erupted uh, again, in uh, 1941 or 1942, so if you Google Vesuvius eruption, you're going to see a lot of pictures of World War II era aircraft and things uh, covered in volcanic ash, right? This eruption was in 79 AD, uh, and it just absolutely wiped out the town of Pompeii, and then the lesser known one is Herculaneum. Something really interesting happened in Pompeii, though, and some of you may see this coming, is that we ended up with casts of the people, a lot of the people who died in this eruption. Um, um, and what happens here is uh, sometimes people get this wrong. So let's just, let's just take a minute and get it right. Um, um, so, so a pyroclastic flow comes tearing down the side of the mountain, kills these poor people, covers them over in ash, right? And so, and so their bodies are entombed in the ash. Um, the body decomposes over time, leaving a person-shaped hole in the ash. Okay, so later on, because the ash has now kind of turned to rock. Um, later on, archaeologists come along, um, and they're excavating, and they're like, whoa, 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 here's a, a, a person-shaped hole. Um, let's fill this hole with plaster and make you know basically a statue of this person uh, it, it, it's ghoulish but at the moment they die and so that's what you're seeing here you're not you're, you're not seeing some sort of weird fossilization or something you're seeing you know plaster statues of these people at the moment of their death and i've seen them and they're creepy 
Uh, they are very, very creepy. It's not just people. Um, uh, animals uh, were preserved this way. Lots of things were preserved this way. A lot of Pompeii was preserved very, very well. It's a very valuable archaeological site because you don't often have Roman era towns, Roman Empire era towns preserved in this much detail. And so archaeologists are just crazy about Pompeii uh, for this reason. But I, like I said, I've seen these, and they, 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 are, they are very creepy. Um, so let's move on. Um, landslides. right? Volcanoes are unstable slope mountains that have earthquakes underneath them. And so you know, it, it only stands to reason that you're going to get <coughs> sorry, landslides. Um, some of them small, some of them big. Um, once again, Mount St. Helens. Uh, 1980, I was right, not 82, began with a landslide. Uh, and so, you know, what happened here was uh, a magma body moved up under here and melted the snow um, on the mountain, um, which sort of mobilized the soil, right? Made it more likely to move and flow. Um, and then a magnitude 5 earthquake set off the largest landslide Ever. Right? And so the entire north flank of the mountain goes sliding down. This is literally the largest landslide that we know of. There might have probably were bigger ones, but this is the biggest one we know of. And so the entire north flank of that mountain comes down. That unloaded the magma chamber, and you can see the pyroclastic flow literally exploding sideways out of the volcano, right? Bad. Um we were expecting it to erupt. They were getting people off. No one was expecting this. There were still geologists on the side of this mountain putting out monitoring equipment when this happened. So um, uh, quite a few of the people killed in the Mount St. Helens eruption were geologists um, working the mountain, uh, trying to monitor it and trying to keep people safe. So, so um uh, you know, landslides, they're, they're, they're local landslides like this one in, I believe, Guatemala are a problem, but this is a problem too. And so now we monitor snow melt on mountains. We monitor slope stability. You know, we learned a lot uh, from Mount St. Helens, a lot of it bad, but, but we, <laughs> well, no, not bad, but, but we learned a lot. We learned an awful lot. Um, the thing that I kind of added to make it from six and a half to seven and a half, local tsunamis. Uh, now, now, volcanoes are not going to make, we talked about this when we talked about earthquakes, they're not going to make the big uh, global tsunamis, okay? But they will make local ones. Um, Krakatoa in 1883 killed 36,000 people with a tsunami, as you can read for yourself. Hold on, I need water. Mm. So, this can be... There have been Alaskan earthquakes that have made tsunamis, small ones, right? Local ones. And so... Um, this can be a real problem, obviously. It, it truly can. So what's the point five, right? Seven and a half. What's the half? Lightning, oddly enough. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, um, um, volcanoes make lightning. Uh, this is a volcano in South America. I don't know its name, but that's not photoshopped in or anything. That's lightning, right? Here's Bob, lightning, right? Here's another volcano. I don't know whose name I don't know in South America. Lightning, right? Um, you see this one frequently on social media. Look, it's a combination of a thunderstorm. and No, 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 no. It's a volcano making lightning, right? Um, you get, you know, a lot of ash moving around. You get a lot of buildup of static electricity from this ash rubbing against itself. There's a lot of heat. There's a lot of energy up in here. You do that right, and you will get absolutely, obviously, get electrical discharges. And so, um, it's not commonly um, deadly, but but remember, um, remember um, uh, that volcano, the Paracutine, that volcano in Mexico, right? No one killed in the lava. Three people killed by lightning. Um, so seven and a half. <laughs> okay. So, um, what else? So a few other things just to wrap up here. Um, <coughs> uh, let me see, uh, calderas, right, other volcanic landforms, right, a lot, you know, um, this is Crater Lake, 
in, I want to say Oregon. Um, this is a caldera, right? This is a, a, a volcanic crater that has filled in with lava. Uh, no, I'm sorry, filled, no, that's, that's, not, that's not lava, that's water, right? Filled in with water. Um, and then there was a little what we would call a resurgent dome over here, Wizard Island, right? And so let's take a look at how this plays out, right? So you got a volcano, volcano erupting. As it expends itself, you get, you know, downward fault. You get what we'll, what we'll learn is called normal faulting. This downward faulting making a hole. That hole fills in with water as holes do. And then you get a little resurgent eruption over here making Wizard Island, right? But this is a beautiful, wonderful caldera. Uh, which is just a uh, you know a volcanic vent that's filled in with water. It's beautiful stuff. Um, we've been kind of on and off with fissure eruptions. You know, I, we I could have put fissure eruption over with a kind of volcano. Um, it could go in a number of places, but you know, here's a fissure eruption, right? A long crack with lava coming out of it. We already saw this in Hawaii, where that fissure eruption produced. Um, produce all of that lava uh, these can produce though a lot of lava there's a couple places we want to look at here one of them is um the deacon um let me see yeah the columbia sorry i was looking at the wrong the wrong screen the uh, columbia river basalts right in you know washington oregon uh here's here's the volcanoes of the cascade range but here's the columbia river basalts huge huge lava flow um here's what it looks like uh and so um you know this was a massive eruption but this was a fissure eruption yeah i don't i honestly couldn't tell you where the fissures are i don't know if anyone knows where they are they're buried underneath all the lava but um but um but fissure eruptions produce a lot of a uh, a lot of um a lot of lava uh, another one that's interesting is the deacon traps in india uh, and so here, you know, this is the, the subcontinent nation of India. And, you know, the red is Deacon Traps. Uh, this was a massive volcanic eruption. Here's a picture of the Deacon Traps um, <coughs> that happened about 65 million years ago. Uh, this is the time when the non-avian dinosaurs, uh, we say non-avian because birds are dinosaurs, y'all, they just are. Um, but this was a time when the non-avian dinosaurs were going extinct about 65, 67 or so million years ago. Uh, that, e that event is very complicated, by the way. Um, and um, if I have time, I'll talk about it. But um, but um, um, the, the, you know, it's not as simple. Okay, so it's not as simple as a great big asteroid hit the Earth and killed things. Okay, it's just it's just not that simple. Um, um, frogs, for example, survived the extinction that killed the non-avian dinosaurs. Frogs, y'all. You look sideways at a frog these days, and it dies. Okay, so so whatever killed the dinosaurs didn't kill the frogs. Work that one out for me. So anyway, okay, uh, it's a complicated event, and so uh, but this was happening during that time. I'm not saying it caused it. It's complicated, but I'm saying it didn't help. You throw this much lava up, you have to have thrown all kinds of gas up, uh, and so um, probably really didn't help. It's not that there wasn't an impact. It's just the the effects of that are very poorly understood, and the the paleontological patterns that we see really don't match just something big smacking into the planet and killing everything. It, it just doesn't work that way. Um, uh, but another fissure eruption. This one's fun. Uh, Locky. Laki is in Iceland, and I, I, yeah, I know you're like, where's the volcano? The volcano is right here, right along here. There's the volcano. Um, what there is of it. Once again, obviously, that's a fissure eruption. 1783, 1784, around in there, Laki erupts, kills a quarter of the people and half of the livestock on the I on Iceland. Um, throws enough sulfur dioxide gas into the air uh, to, to kill a bunch of people and um, enough ash into the air to block the sun. Once again, not globally, but locally. And that ash, as we know, Icelandic volcanoes, <laughs> right? They send stuff to Europe. 
And so 1783, 1784, uh, this volcano sends a bunch of ash and toxic gas uh, over to Europe, in particular France, um, causing all kinds of problems and crop failures and all kinds of things. And does anyone know offhand what was going on in France in the 17, 1783, 1784? Yeah, the French Revolution. Uh, and so there's a, an interesting and decent case to be made that while an Icelandic volcano might not have caused the French Revolution, it definitely contributed to it, right? You, it causes crop failures in France and a bunch of hungry French people get pissed off and overthrow the government or overthrow the king anyway. So, so yeah, so, uh, you know, kind of interesting. <laughs> I don't know. That's just one of my favorite things. Uh, if you look at Mount St. Helens these days, it's got, it's got a, this structure in the middle of it called Lava Dome. Um, it is growing by about a dump truck load of rock a day. Uh, okay, uh, and so, and that's because there is still a, 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 a lava source down there, uh, and so these bulges that we see um, as that lava is slowly pushed up, uh, and and bulges on the side is called a lava dome. This dome is monitored very carefully. Uh, to see, you know, what's going on there, right? Because, um, you know, it can erupt and make a fiery pyroclastic flow. I love the adjective fiery down there on pyroclastic flow. So, yeah, uh, we looked at we looked at Shiprock, New Mexico, when we were looking at igneous structures. There it is again um, within this context of a volcanic neck or a plug, right? And so, you know, <coughs> we were looking at the dikes, around ship rock but they're ship rock and you go out west and you see a lot of things like this where you know you have a volcano um and then you know you get some solidified rock in the neck of the volcano all of this is going to erode fairly quickly on the other hand that solid igneous rock coming up through is not and so a lot of times what you'll get is this um is this um uh this this extruded rock sticking up right and as we know because we looked at it with we told when we talked about dikes is there are dikes radiating out from this uh that are really really quite fascinating but this is another kind of a uh, kind of a uh volcanic structure okay uh i got a slide but i'm not sure the point of it so there it is um Different volcanoes, different types of volcanoes in different parts of the world. That's probably what that is. Anyway, um, okay, so that's volcanoes, everyone. Okay, um, I'll get this uploaded to YouTube, and y'all enjoy it, and um, we'll talk to you uh, next time. Okay, bye-bye.